so after discussing about uh, the basic uh, role of financial system and how it is related to the economic growth, uh, we can start the discussion on certain concepts which are linked to this particular financial system and uh, this particular concepts will be used across the different type of financial institutions and market what we are going to discuss in the coming sessions. So, as you know that uh, the most important thing in the financial system is the management of the risk, because every participants come to the market knowing that they are going to expose certain amount of risk and accordingly they want to maximize their return uh, in such a way that the whatever risks they will face the risk can be adjusted and as well as they can get certain return for their uh, benefits and as well as the maximization of the wealth. So, keeping those things in the mind uh, we can start uh, some discussion related to different type of risk what always we observe in the financial system as a whole. Then uh, those type of risk uh, will be discussed more elaborately whenever we go and discuss uh, whenever we are going to discuss these particular market and institutions specifically in the following sessions. So, let us first see that uh, what do we mean by the risk, how the risk is defined. So, you might have known that uh, the risk and uncertainty these are the two words which are popularly used in the finance literature and uh, there are some kind of theoretical differences between them. So, I, I will give you this uh, basic differences between them little bit uh, later, but let us first uh, analyze or try to understand what exactly the risk is. So, risk is basically a situation where uh, the objective probability distribution of the values a variable is known, even though the exact values it would take are not known. What exactly it means? It means that whenever we are going to predict something in the market or we are going to say that how this particular stock or particular bond is going to perform and what is the probability that we are going to 5 percent, 10 percent, 15 percent return we can have different scenarios. For example, you say that uh, let the uh, particular market has uh, uh, three scenarios, one is uh, a normal condition, there is a normal condition, there is a recession and there is boom, the market is growing up. So, in these two conditions, let we can assign different probability that okay, there is a probability that if there is a boom and there is a 40 percent chance there will be a boom. So, if there is a boom the return will be let 10 percent and there is a 30 percent chance may be the market will be in the normal condition the return will be 8 percent and if there is a recession there is a also probability that is 30 percent probability there is a recession and you can get let 5 percent return. So, here what we are trying to say that whenever we are talking about the return what we are going to observe from the market, we are defining a certain probability distribution and we are assigning that if something is going to happen then what is the probability that we are going to get this amount of return or this amount of return or this amount of return. But exactly we do not know whether really these returns can be realized or not, but still we are thinking there is a probability that this kind of return can be achieved from the market. So, that is why we are, we are saying that the exact values basically is not known here, but we can go for a probability distribution of that particular variable which is our outcome variable or the focused variable. And how the probability distribution is made? The probability distribution is made on the basis of the theory and the past experience and as well as the laws of chance. What basically this we have the data about that particular variable which is available for maybe last 10 years, 15 years 
and we have observed that how this data behaved in the last periods and accordingly we can decide that if the data is behaving in this way historically then how this particular data is going to behave in the future also. So, the probability distribution can be derived from the past observations whatever we have and accordingly we can assign certain probability with respect to this and finally, this uh, expected return what we are going to get from this that can be calculated. So, therefore, uh, here what we say what is the risk here? The risk here is for example, you are expecting that if there is a boom you are going to get 10 percent return, but it is not necessary that you are going to get this 10 percent return. The reason is maybe you may get 12 percent or you may get also 8 percent. So, what is trying to say if there is a deviation, if there is a deviation from the actual expectations whatever you have, it is not actual basically you are expecting something. So, if you are expecting something, but you are getting something that means there is a probability that whatever thing you are expecting that may not be realized. So, if it is not going to be realized or it is not going to be materialized then we are facing certain amount of risk in the market. That means, we are saying that investment or positioning in the market is risky because whatever way we are expecting that particular thing may not be received by us. So, then what basically we are trying to say if the variation is more then the risk will be more you are expecting 10 percent you are getting 1 percent somebody else is expecting 8 percent 10 percent getting 8 percent. So, there is a differences if somebody is getting uh, uh, 2 percent or 3 percent were expecting 10 percent and somebody is getting 8 percent, but he was expecting 10 percent. So, there is a deviation the deviation there is a variation in the deviations. So, that variation or the variability basically measures the risk how the actual value is deviated from the expected value. So, in the statistical sense the expected value is nothing but the mean value of that particular series that is what in the simplistic way we can say although there are different ways the expectations of that particular distribution can be calculated. But in general we can say that the mean value of that particular series can be used as the expectations or expected value of that particular data. So, that is why more the variation the risk will be more and uh, obviously, if the broader the range of the possible outcomes the greater is the risk. So, more the variation more is the risk that is what basically what we can conclude. So, the risk what we are going to face that is not basically related to the actual return what you are getting that is related to the we always calculate the risk with respect to the variation of the return of that particular data with respect to the expected return what we are expecting or we are calculating before. So, that is that is why the variability or the dispersion in the possible outcomes basically measures the risk of that particular series or risk of that particular distribution. So, this is the basic concept of the risk uh, what always we observe in the market or we always use it uh, uh, in our analysis. Then let us see that how this what are the popular measures of risk how the risk is basically measured. Whenever we measure the risk all of you might have known that uh, the basic way of measuring the risk is the variance. The basic way of the measuring the risk is basically the, the basic way of the the basic way of the measuring the risk uh, is basically what uh, we can say that that is the standard deviation. So, variance or standard deviation these are the basic measures of the risk. So, here what we are trying to say that uh, all of you know that how the variance can be calculated that it is the deviation from the uh, the mid, uh, deviation from the mean of that actual series 
if you take the square of that divided by the degrees of freedom that is n minus 2. So, that basically measures the standard deviation of that uh, or variance of that series and if you take the square root of the variance then we can measure the standard deviation. So, this variance and standard deviation these are the two things basically what we always use for measuring the risk in the market. Uh, so, then another thing is basically you see we can also use the covariance. The covariance basically measures the, uh, the risk of the security the relative to the other security in the portfolio. And whenever we are comparing the different type of alternatives whatever we have, if you are comparing the alternatives of the uh, choosing the assets in the market, then what basically we are trying to do? We are using the concept of uh, the uh, covariance or how the covariance between x and y and that covariance between x and y is basically measures the risk factor of that particular or relatively how that particular uh, variable is uh, risky and whether this particular or uh, particular uh, alternative can be taken for uh, investment or not. And another thing also we have that is called the coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation basically whenever uh, we use it, we use it basically whenever we are comparing the two alternatives. For example, in one alternative you have A and another alternative you have the B. If e A is giving 10 percent return and giving a risk of 8 percent and B is giving a return of 12 percent and you are facing a risk of 9 percent, then here if there is a dilemma that which alternative should be chosen. So, in that particular point of time basically we use the coefficient of variation and the coefficient of variation is nothing but that the for one unit of the risk how much extra return you are getting. It is basically the ratio between the, uh, the mean return what you are getting and the standard deviation. So, that particular measure is used whenever we have the different alternatives and we are going to uh, use that alternatives in the market for the investment or choosing the investment from the uh, varieties of alternatives which are available. Then another type of measure we have uh, popularly used that is called the value at risk. So, what this value at risk means? The value at risk is basically a statistical measure. The value at risk is a statistical measure of the riskiness of the financial asset. It is a statistical measure of the riskiness of the financial assets or portfolio of the assets. What it is basically what it defines? How we can uh, define this value at risk? The value at risk is nothing but the maximum amount you are expecting, maximum amount expected to be lost over a given time horizon at a predefined confidence level. In the statistics, you might have uh, known about the confidence level and the significance level. And whenever we measure the value at risk, we basically consider at what significance level or at what confidence level we are basically measuring this value at risk. So, if you have the 95 percent confidence level, then that means significance level is 100 percent minus 95 percent that is 5 percent. If it is uh, 90 percent confidence level, then it is significance level is 10 percent like that. So, here what we are trying to say, if you see this example, if 95 percent one month bar is rupees 5 million, that means if you want to interpret it, what basically the interpretation is? The interpretation is there is 95 percent confidence that over the next month the portfolio will not loss more than 5 million. What basically it means? It means that what is the maximum loss or the worst loss somebody can make in a particular time period at a particular confidence level that is basically is defined as the value at risk. So, value at risk is basically a measure which try to tell you that what is the maximum loss this particular investor or particular company is going to make if he or she wants to invest in the market. 
that is basically the measure of the value at uh, risk or this is the way the value at risk can be defined. Then uh, if you see that there are different type of risk, uh, broadly the risk can be defined in two ways, one is your systematic risk and another one is the unsystematic risk. What do you mean by the systematic risk? The systematic risk is a risk which is basically everybody is basically suffering from that. All the entities are exposed to the systematic risk because that is basically related to the macroeconomic fundamentals. And uh, if the general market or macroeconomic fundamentals like interest rate, inflation, all these things uh, became volatile. So, in that sense we can say that the uh, we are exposed to the systematic risk of particular market. That means, whether any company operates or any individual operates in the market. So, if there is a change in the inflation, there is a change in the interest rate, everything. So, then what will happen that everybody will be going to face that particular risk in the system. So, therefore, it is called systematic. So, any kind of investment strategy if you want to make, so that particular risk cannot be diversified. So, this on systematic risk cannot be diversified that is why the other name of the systematic risk is also undiversifiable risk. This particular risk cannot be diversified in the system. So, whatever way you want to make your portfolio strategy or investment strategy that is not going to help the participants the investor to uh, reduce or to diversify that risk in the market. Then another type of risk is the unsystematic risk. So, this unsystematic risk uh, is basically nothing but uh, this risk is uh, specific to the particular entity either it is maybe with respect to individual or with respect to a company. So, any fluctuations within the company like if the sales is fluctuating or if there is some kind of uneven situations which have occurred in the company but that is not applicable to another company. So, those kind of events, those kind of incidents can also the create certain kind of risk for the particular uh, investment alternatives or for that particular entity. So, those risks can be diversified, those risks can be diversified. What in the sense what we are trying to say, if any, any, any kind of investor wants to invest in the stock market, if they are holding 50 stocks or 20 stocks or 30 stocks. So, in that context what happens that if all those 30 stocks if he has chosen and if one stock is not, not doing well another stock can do, do well and one sector particular may not perform well but another sector may perform well. So, in that context what they are trying to do they are trying to minimize the risk. So, that is why what we can say the unsystematic risk is also known as it is called the idiosyncratic risk. The idiosyncratic risk is nothing but it is specific to the individuals. It is specific to the individuals and uh, those kind of risk can be diversified if you are holding more number of assets or more number of alternatives investment alternatives in the system or your, your investment portfolio. That is why uh, we can say that this is a diversifiable risk. So, if you are holding more assets in your portfolio then this particular risk can be diversified. So, this is basically the uh, another thing what uh, we can we can say. Then let us discuss that uh, what are those different types of systematic risk, major type of systematic risk what we face in the market. So, the first one is the beta, the market risk which is defined as beta uh, and another one is the interest rate risk, inflation risk exchange rate or the currency risk. These are the major risk which are driven by the changes in the macroeconomic fundamentals and because of changes in the macroeconomic fundamentals this every market participants are exposed to this type of risk in the market. So, let us see that uh, how this particular uh, uh, how this particular type of risk are defined and what basic how we can measure this. So, then uh, we can come to first the market risk which is popularly known as beta. So, what this beta indicates 
the beta indicates the extent to which the risk of a given asset is non diversifiable and it is basically measured as a coefficient which measures the securities relative volatility with respect to the market volatility. So, how this beta is calculated? So, if you if in the sense let me explain you that how the beta is calculated. So, beta is calculated in this way that beta is equal to the covariance between the individual assets return of the individual assets with the market return divided by the variance of the market. So, this is the covariance between I represents the individual return from the asset it may be stock it may be bond it can be anything and this m represents the market return. So, here how this m for example, if you take the stock market in the stock market the m is basically what let you can take a proxy BSC sensex this is an index and people consider this is a market portfolio this is a market portfolio. So, the return from the BSC can be considered as the market return. Let you are using a stock A, the stock A's return is basically represented as I. So, we are talking about the covariance between the return of the individual asset or individual stock and the return from the market divided by the variance of the market that will give you the value of the beta. So, here what we are telling that if you little bit expand it then your covariance i and m is nothing but the standard deviation of i into the standard deviation of m into the correlation between i and m divided by the variance of m. So, one variance one standard deviation one standard deviation can be cancelled out. So, you will end up with the standard deviation of the market multiplied by the correlation between i and i uh, return of the individual security and the market divided by the uh, uh, sorry this is standard deviation of i standard deviation f will be cancelled out then we have the standard deviation of the market. So, in general uh, we can represent it that uh, uh, your covariance i m uh, is equal to or the beta is equal to basically this one. The beta is equal to covariance is equal to this standard deviation of i into standard deviation of f into the correlation between i and m divided by the variance of m. So, then what has happened finally, one standard deviation of m can be cancelled out because the standard deviation variance of m is nothing but standard deviation of m into standard deviation of m. Then finally, we have your final your beta is equal to standard deviation of i divided by the standard deviation of m into the correlation between i and m. This i represents already I told you this is the return from the individual stock or individual security and this is the return from the market and this is the variance uh, sorry standard deviation of the market and this is the standard deviation of the return of the particular security. So, that is why this is basically what uh, this is basically the uh, calculation of the beta. See, this, this is the actual calculation of the beta but the beta also can be calculated in other way. Uh, if you regress, if you, you can run a regression line, let r i is equal to beta r m. This is the simplistic way of calculation, the beta is the coefficient, r m is the market return. Then what you can do, you can take two columns, one column you can take the return from this individual asset and another column you can take the return from the market run a regression your r i is the dependent variable r m is the independent variable and whatever coefficient you will find that coefficient also this beta this is basically the also the market risk this is all, this is the way also the market risk can be calculated. So, therefore, the security uh, the uh, this is the slope and the security with a higher beta is more volatile than the market and the asset with a lower beta would rise a would rise or fall more slowly than the how the market is volatile that is the way the beta can be defined. Then we can uh, come to the 
other type of risk that is uh, basically you have uh, interest rate risk. So, what this interest rate risk is basically talk about? The interest rate risk is basically nothing but the variability of the return on security due to changes in the level of market interest rate. If you go back, uh, the generally this uh, if there is a change in the interest rate, then the value of this particular asset gets changed. How it basically happens? For example, if you talk about the bond, the price of the bond is what? If you if you if you write this uh, price of the bond, the price of the bond works in this way. Let V zero is equal to your cash flow divided by one plus R to the power t, and this R is nothing but the interest rate or the discount rate. So here, if you see, if your R changes, then V zero changes. If R increases, the value of the bond goes down. If R declines, the value of the bond goes up because it is in the it is a discount factor which is taken in the uh, denominator. And here the price is increasing. For example, somebody has invested in the bond, and in the bond they get the coupon. So the coupon is nothing but the regular cash flow, right? And as well as in the principal amount, whenever in the end we get it. So in that context, what we say. If the interest rate increases, the value of the bond goes down. But whatever coupon they get, if the coupon amount can be reinvested in the market, they get more return. That's why whenever the value of the bond goes down, we say that increase the interest rate declines the value of the bond. That's why the price risk increases, which is called the price risk. And whatever money we get it from the coupon, like if your bond value, the par value of the bond is thousand rupees, you your coupon is ten percent. Then every year you will be getting 100 rupees. If that 100 rupees again you are reinvesting in the market, then if your interest rate goes up, maybe you can get some more return. So therefore, the price risk and reinvestment risk work in the opposite direction. Then we can uh, uh, come to the uh, other type of risk like inflation that everybody knows. Inflation is basically nothing but the purchasing power. If inflation goes up, the purchasing power of the consumer goes down and uh, that is always if the inflation increases the real value of that particular asset goes down because it affects or it, it negatively affects the purchasing power. So, therefore, always we should expect that inflation should be low because the real addition or real return from that particular asset can be increasing. But always you remember whenever we compare or we try to analyze the inflation risk we are not talking about the actual inflation which is happening now, we also consider the uncertain inflation or the expected inflation. The expected inflation is very much important whenever you talk about the inflation risk in the market. So, that is basically we have to keep in the mind. Then we have another one that is called the exchange rate or the currency risk. So, the currency risk uh, all of you much, very much aware about if there is a change in the exchange rate then the value of that particular currency changes and that affects every type of international transactions or anybody who are doing this international business across this uh, basically it affects mostly the multinational companies and who are doing the foreign exchange business. So, therefore, the exchange rate risk is defined as the cash flow variability experienced by the economic units engaged in the international business or international exchange. And there is no exchange rate risk you see that we have different type of exchange rate system like India adopts a managed exchange rate system, China adopts a fixed exchange rate system because the government decide how should, what should be the exchange rate of that particular currency with respect to another currency. So, if there is a fixed exchange rate system we are not exposed to exchange rate risk if there is a floating exchange rate system market determines how much should be the exchange rate of that particular currency with respect to another currency then what will happen that we are much more exposed to the exchange rate uh, risk and accordingly the value of the asset can go down. So, therefore, these are the different uh, uh, one of the major risk which is affecting the value. Then finally, the country risk the country risk is basically what the particular risk which uh, uh, to which the political and economic unrest affect the value of the securities. If there is a probability that there is instabil instability in the political scenario 
or there is no political stability exist in the system, then what will happen that basically affects the uh, balance of payment. Mostly it affects the buyers country uh, who are basically doing this foreign exchange business or any kind of business whatever anybody any company is doing or any individual is doing. And that is why it is the probability of loss due to political instability in the buyers country resulting in inability to pay for imports. Because there is a political instability, we sometimes that affects the whole economic system and generally if it is, uh, it is adversely affecting the balance of payment and finally, the value of the total assets can be affected. So, that is the way the currency, uh, uh, the country risk can be defined. So, these are the major type of systematic risk and uh, we will be discussing the unsystematic risk in the next session. Please go through this particular uh, references uh, for this particular session. Thank you.